Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the CNE Sales Monthly Webinar. I'm Jeff Butler, the Technical Manager of CNE Sales. Today's webinar is on Banner Engineering's new expandable safety controller, the XS26-2. Our presenter today is Steve Westfall from Banner Engineering. Banner is a senior applications engineer and has been with Banner for 10 years. The last eight have been as a safety applications engineer. If you have questions for Steve throughout the seminar, please use the questions window on the right side of your screen and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. I'll now turn the webinar over to Steve. Well, good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, just want to talk about the XS26 today. It's the expandable controller, but the software that goes with it is really not that new because we've had that available since we introduced the SC26 uh, last February. So, But the new announcement as of uh, a couple months ago was the release of the expandable controller to give you even more capability for some of the inputs and outputs that you want to associate with that. Um, now, why do we even have an expandable controller? Why are there expandable controllers out there in the field? Uh, Here's a good example, and I just want to show you what I've got on my tabletop here. For instance, if I have this many components, and the reason I have the components is because I want an e-stop. Um, I have a gate switch, perhaps a, a second gate switch that I'm going to tie in series as an example. Uh, two AND controls, a light curtain, uh, another light curtain in here, perhaps I want to uh, allow this light curtain to be muted. Well, then you'll want to be able to somehow show the, some of the status information and maybe it's a matter of, a, of a, a tower light like this that's driven from a PLC or something. So the fact that we have all these components and without the technology that's available today, you're going to end up with a lot of le uh, sorry relay logic that's going to be in your cabinet. For instance, if I wanted to uh, add a couple of light curtains. It might be a couple of interface modules. Uh, if we're looking at the e-stops and the gate switches, we're going to have uh, a couple more modules in our cabinet. If I wanted instead to take one of those light curtains and send it through a controller that's going to give me the muting, uh, we're starting to add that controller. And, and the reason that we have, and this is the anti tie module here, the reason that there are so many needs for its com controllers with uh, simple relay logic and, and monitoring is that there are specific uh, needs for a two-hand control. This is an anti-tie-down module, so you need to have a certain type of controller to accommodate that. Same thing with the muting. Uh, there might be a need to bring in uh, closed contacts or solid-state outputs from a light curtain, from a gate switch, whatever you're muting, into something where you can now bring in the mute sensors, and so it starts to get to the point where you're starting to expand your cabinet available space here, and it's really uh, cost and wiring wise, it's really starting to get to the point where is there an alternative way of doing this that's going to be uh, making a lot more sense. All right, let me get that all off here. Uh, so without really going through a PowerPoint, I just want to go right to the software and be able to to highlight what the software is, how do we get the, um, the software to do what we want to have done. And again, we've had this software available since the first of the year for the sake of the non-expandable SC26, but I want to at least highlight what are some of the benefits of this. First of all, this is when you first fire up the free software, I should say. Uh, it is free and downloadable from our website. When you do first open up the software, you will come to the equipment view as you see here. Now I've added a couple of components here, but the fact that if it's not an expandable controller, this same software allows you the ability to at least show what it really is. If you have purchased a non-expandable uh, controller because you may not need all that extra expansion, you can go down to this edit section right here. Oh, let's highlight. We, you click on the uh, the actual picture of the controller, and now when you go into edit, here is where you can pretty much tell it what it is. If it's not expandable, 
If it does not have the capability or you do not need the capability for an Ethernet connection to, to be able to gather all the status information or you do not necessarily want to pay the extra cost of a display, you can set this up to be just what you want to have here. If I have this set up such as this, you notice now it's called an SC26-2. If instead it is expandable and I do want an Ethernet connection on there and I do want a display, now it is showcased as an XS26 and it does have the display on there. So it gives you a reference of what you're really dealing with here. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to at least show what I'm adding here. I'm adding a, an e-stop and a gate switch and, and maybe just to show you what else is the capability, what the capability is here. This is the screen that you will want to add more modules. If I know I want to go to a relay module. Steve? Yes. This is Jeff Butler. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your, uh, your laptop, it looks like it needs to be plugged in. Your battery symbol is showing that you're almost out of power. Oh, really? Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, that's not going to make anybody happy if that happens, right? <laughs> for, for, for Ethernet IP, you'll need the four twisted pairs. Thanks to one of our attentive uh, attendees that noticed. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. No problem. Guy's doing a webinar. Didn't plug in his laptop. And you can see his battery button at the bottom, so it's starting to turn red. <laughs> <laughs> so he just went away. So I'm not sure where is, where he went to. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Steve, do we still have contact with you? Apologize for the technical difficulties here. Let's uh, see if Steve can get his uh, audio back. And that. How about this? Are, are we back? We are back, Steve. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. All right. Well, folks, uh, 
where was I? I guess I was showing you the uh, section that was allowing me to add modules. And with the expandability, you will get this extra icon up here where once you click it, you can now choose the choices for, in this case, input modules. We have two types of input modules where you get an extra eight terminals for inputs or 16 terminals for inputs. I should mention the main controller itself, the name XS26 in this case means it has 26 input terminals. Now that doesn't mean you're tying in 26 e-stops because sometimes the e-stops and the wiring may uh, be four terminals, it might be three terminals, two terminals, it all depends on what you found to uh, need for your protection level, what your risk assessment has shown you. Do you really need redundancy and that type of thing? But if you do run out of terminals, then you can add on a slice of inputs. Or if you choose instead to need outputs, we do have four choices. Four choices are that you get a, an extra set or pair of OSSD outputs, which are solid state outputs, good for about a half of an amp. Uh, actually, in this module, it's good for three quarters of an amp on those outputs. And then there's another choice for the output modules, which are going to have not just one pair of OSSD outputs, but also you're going to have two pairs or four individual if you want to split them. Uh, these two here are your relay modules, which makes it nice and convenient for the fact that you can just add the relays modules on there that you need. Um, once you've added them on there, for the sake of monitoring, there's no need to now attach a wire to bring back to the controller an EDM or an external device monitoring input. Uh, it already has that monitoring capability just by uh, adding this to the main module and through the communication and the other ports that are on here. There's an 8-pin connector, actually. Uh, that's where all the uh, communication and the monitoring is taking place. So adding modules here is just a matter of clicking on what you need, and it can hold a maximum of eight modules beyond the main unit itself. Now there's no need to look for a network module. Uh, that is already incorporated if you choose that as your uh, model you've purchased. It's already incorporated with RJ45 connector right on this main module here. Okay. I'm going to start with a brand new configuration here. So uh, let's look at what else we can do on this screen view. We've shown how it is easy to add more modules, but if we're just going to stick with one module at this point and highlight what you can do as far as adding inputs, you'll basically click on this icon and anyone that's familiar with our our uh, previous product that we still do manufacture and sell but it's the SC22 that was our first uh, entry into the configurable type controllers and now that we've advanced to this expandable as well as uh, the the module we're looking at here we, we're going to have a lot more logic available is what you'll see soon but the selection of the equipment that you want to add on here is just the, the, the same layout, the same pattern, the same types of inputs as we were able to use on the SC22 for the last, uh, boy, six years or so since we've had that. But let's look at what we want to do. We can add safety inputs. We can add non-safety inputs. And part of that will probably be the selection of the manual reset. That's probably going to be something you typically may want to use. And uh, for that, for the purpose of perhaps uh, resetting your system after an e-stop has been pressed, uh, you may have light curtains that are set up for the point of operation type of application where all you're really doing is stick your hand through the curtain and you can't physically crawl through and be on the other side. There are some inputs like that that may not need a reset. But here's the available uh, selection of manual reset. I'm also going to select, and this is probably going to be a commonplace here that you might want to consider. When you first pass this configuration into a controller, it's going to do some checking, uh, some readings, some writing to allow you to confirm 
that it is doing the right thing is that you know once you've done that and you pass it into the controller, it's going to ask for a system reset. Well, you can cycle power on the controller to perform that reset, or you can check this box to allow this manual reset to also serve as a system reset when it needs it. All right. Let's just add something very, very simple. And safety input-wise, we're really talking about probably what everyone should have on there is some sort of a, an e-stop if there are some possible hazards that can be found. Uh, this is an e-stop. This is the wiring, and we're always going to initially show you the Category 4 type wiring schemes. In other words, to get the most monitoring you can get, uh, a four-terminal layout of an e-stop is uh, the Category 4 uh, selection. With this selection, just to review, if there are two channels coming back for the redundant contacts within one e-stop, then you're going to have some modulated pulses that are going to be sent out from the controller and returned back through this contact. So it's going to look to make sure that these, this modulation does continue all the way back through uh, the switches and into the input side of the controller again. Notice the addressing of the terminals we have amongst these 26 input terminals, there are eight of those that can be used as outputs. Now, one way of delivering an output is to have what you're seeing here. It's going to output a modulation pulse that is going to, uh, and it's a voltage level as well, but it's going to send that through the contact, so that's selecting an I.O. I.O. 1 and I.O. 2. If I choose, and this is amongst the eight convertible outputs, where they can be inputs or outputs, it doesn't mean I'm wasting those terminals by using them the first time. If I add another e-stop, notice that it used IO1 and IO2 a second time, which is a benefit here. We're not allowing more than uh, two to be connected to the same output terminal, but the fact that you can use them twice before it now selects the next I.O. 3 and 4 is kind of nice. It's not really eight convertible outputs. It's more like 12 now that you can use uh, them for uh, a couple of times here. All right, gate switch. I'm going to look at my gate switch selection. And sometimes this can be, uh, it may not be normally closed contacts that you're really looking for. Now, if they are mechanically uh, mechanical door interlocks where you have contacts that open and close as you as you open the door uh, they do need to be normally closed uh, there are however some layouts some types of gate switches that might actually be working with a complementary pair a good example is a non-contact magnetic style switch where that is a complementary pair that's used for that type of switch. So it's nice that there's some accommodating selections here so that you can choose what matches the actual wiring need for that type of input. All right, I'm just going to keep it at this simple state at this point just to show now you've got some input. What else can I do? And for that, I'm going to go to the functional view. Now, if you're very familiar with the SC22 from the past, that was simple to set up because all you were doing is simply adding inputs and now telling the controller which output is it going to. And it ended up being just one big old AND gate. This has got a lot more capability. You are now able to not only do what you had done before by selecting an AND gate to add these inputs together, but you can see here there is a lot more selections for the function or logic types that you want to go with. If I choose an AND gate, I'm staying within the safety realm because I want to make sure all these doors are shut. All of these uh, uh, e-stops are rearmed by pulling out on the, the knob after you've pushed it and that type of thing. Now, I can have up to eight of these inputs all ANDed together. I'm sorry, five of these inputs all ANDed together. I'm now showing that there's four inputs coming in, so I'm going to leave it at four. 
select it. And now it's just a matter of, whoops, that's a reset. Forgive me. Let's get back to three. Notice it did come up with that message, and I'll just purposely do it again. It's, it's saying I recognize this as a manual reset. What are you doing bringing it in as a, a safety input? A reset is really not a safety input. You're using a reset because the hazard is already stopped and you're just trying to get this to turn on again. So when we're looking at inputs that need to be added together to keep the output on or to get the output to turn on, we're basically going to an AND gate. So I'm just dragging these in here. Notice I, I'm not really forced to have to keep these in the same little areas uh, that they popped up in. I can move these around whatever it, whatever it is that makes this look a little bit better to use. Uh, as you start to add on a lot more logic and a lot more inputs, this can get quite convoluted and it's nice just to make it appear where it's, uh, it's uh, something at least easy to look at. Okay, what do we have here? We've got simple e-stops and gate switches coming to an AND gate. Well, if that is going to a common output, and notice before I do that, there is a checklist on the left-hand side for everything that you have not successfully completed yet. There's an advisory board here that says you've got to connect something to a safety output. You've got an A1 um, AND gate here that is not connected at all. So once I complete these tasks, the goal is to get this to finally show a green light. The configuration is valid and can be sent to the controller. So we've completed, at least at this point, the tasks that have been required. What about this reset? Well, the reset might be there because I want to simply have a reset available to perform that system reset that might be needed. However, I have e-stops here. I have gate switches. I want, for the sake of the e-stops, and possibly for the gate switch here, I want a manual reset. So you can either add a function block, and amongst the function blocks there is the latch reset block. And now if that's included, and I'll show you a couple of areas where you can use this reset capability. Right now it's asking for and let me expand this a little bit. Right up at the top right corner, I can increase the view. But you'll notice as I start to grab the AND gate, one of these two, and it might be hard to see over this webinar, but there is a color change on the script on this function block. Notice if you do uh, that it's either going to be green or red, but also as you go to one or the other, it's going to mention the fact that that's the wrong place to put this output. I'm going to drag it into the in, and now it's looking for a latch reset input, and that's this guy here. Well, is there an easier way to make this look a little bit better? Sure. I can drag this out here and actually pull an input off of here, locate it somewhere else where it might be a little more convenient, uh, and that way it gives you more space to add more inputs on here if you wish. But there's a, so you're not stuck having to use where some of these uh, these added inputs are are first uh, introduced here. So I'm not done yet. I'm still going to go to that safety output, and this is then again a completed circuit path. It's uh, it's showing that something very simple is added together, and we're going to reset it every time that uh, we need to. Uh, shut the door again or rearm that uh, e-stop after it's been pressed. In looking at, and you'll notice I don't have to necessarily go back to the equipment view to add more inputs. I can carry that function out on this functional view as well. The same input. Uh, if, if I'm adding some of these inputs, or I'll just highlight what I've already got. If I want to change something on this gate switch, I double click on it. Now I'm getting into the properties again where I can do some things that might come in very handy, such as adding an enable startup test. What does this do? If I am going to have this machine shut down for a month, as an example, and now I'm firing it up for the first time, 
well, what's gone on in this, the last time we used it? How do we know that um, our gate switches, our e-stops are still functional? If you select a startup test on this given input, it will not allow the output to turn on when you're using this until you have successfully opened and closed that input so that the controller can see that both contacts reacted the way they should and once it is satisfied that the contact opened and closed as assigned, it will then let you use that input now for the sake of turning on the output. So that's a feature. Also, and this might be even for the sake of troubleshooting, but if there happened to be a problem with a given switch and it seemed like it was happening on third shift or whatever, uh, there might be some things that are evident on third shift, more temperature, more humidity. Uh, you're getting these simultaneity errors as an example, and you're trying to figure out what can I do to, to uh, at least find out if, if, if it is a sticky switch or something else. You can go into this advanced tab right here. Once you select it, now you can add some debounce time. And for the sake of some of these magnetic switches, sometimes the way that they're introduced to each other as far as the magnet end and the sensor end, this might be a benefit to give it a little bit more time so that when you're shutting a door, if there happens to be any vibration involved, you can set a certain debounce time so that it will at least settle down before it looks at those contacts. And uh, that's it's helped a lot in the past just by adding a little bit of debounce time. Now, the one that you're probably going to want to address is going to be the open to close. We don't want to cause the, uh, the response time when you open it to be jeopardized, but we do only allow you to go to one second. So it's not like you can set this thing up for an unsafe time. But the one that might be most prevalent on a door switch is when somebody's done opening the door and they slam the door shut, there could be a lot more vibration introduced and in going from an open to close. So that might be a point where you want to try adding 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, just to see if that takes care of the faults that could occur just from vibration and shock. But that setting's in there, a nice, uh, a nice additive. Also noticing here, simultaneous compared to concurrent. What does that mean? Well, simultaneous is going to give you the ability where if it sees that the contacts have responded where they both opened and now that they're both closing, simultaneous will say, if I don't see the other contact reacting within three seconds of the first one, I'm going to come up with a fault. And that's a good thing because it might prove that you've got a sticky situation. There's some contacts that are sticking and not reacting as quickly as they used to. If you want to take that away, then selecting concurrent will give you that. Now as a concurrent uh, setup, it could last, you know, it could be waiting for the next day for that second contact to react. So there's no timing influence on that comparison between the two contacts coming in. However, I would think simultaneous is the better way to go, but at least we give you the choice. Okay. Now, um, just to kind of show what else can we do on this screen here, uh, I want to, or uh, even on the first screen, now we have, we have safety inputs, obviously. We have non-safety inputs, but that gives us some more capability even on the simple thing that we've just done now, if I wanted to bring in a simple on condition, I can do this. I can have this uh, simple non-safety input be something like, uh, well, if we are trying to work in an a controlled room, uh, people in the past have used the uh, discrete output that would indicate that you've gone out of range on temperature or humidity because they wanted to just bring it into a common controller where they can monitor that. Um, that's, a, that's a type of an input that could be brought in here, not necessarily for the sake of adding it to safety. However, it would allow you to do that if you wanted to make sure there's a certain non-safety element that has to be present before you can really turn on the machine. Uh, that might be something you want to consider adding to the safety. But more times than not, and it's telling us up here, you've got to connect this non-safety input to something. 
Well, I can use this to basically track it. If that's all I wanted to do is have a common place where I can track this, I can do it in more than one way, but the common way might be to go back to this first screen. Now, amongst the choices, safety input, non-safety input, the first equipment view screen is the only place you'll see the ability to select status outputs. Now we're able to use some of those available um, output terminals. Remember there are convertible input-output terminals. You can use, if there are some available, you can use those to now give you a status indication whether you're tracking a safety input, uh, tracking an output, waiting for reset. All of these conditions that are highlighted in blue are capable to be tracked right now. The ones that are darkened out in gray, well, we don't have a bypass condition. We haven't introduced uh, or included a muting type of a setup yet, so they are in the grayed out state. But if I did want to track that non-safety input, I'll select track input. And now it's giving me, it's assigning it to a terminal. And it's giving me the choice of what are you tracking. Here are the inputs you've added so far on this simple configuration. I'm going to choose that non-safety input that I brought in here. And when that thing is active, I want an output to turn on. However, that polarity can be reversed if you choose to instead have the zero volt level when it's active and when it is not present, that will generate a status output that will go high. So that's the selection that you see here. I'm just going to cancel that whole thing. Get rid of uh, this. And again, if you click on it, you want to get rid of it, just highlight it, delete it. Okay. What else so far? I'm not, I've just kept it simple just so you can kind of follow what we've done without adding a lot of complexity yet. But now that we have our inputs coming in here, we have things that seem to have been completed due to the fact that it's giving us the green light. What else can we look at on this screen? Well, I have a wiring diagram that I can look at, and here is where you're seeing exactly what terminals it assigned all of our inputs on. However, you can change these if it's more convenient to include all your inputs on a given terminal block, you can change where those things are coming in and going out of if that makes more sense. However, um, it's giving us also the availability of everything that has not been used yet. So you can more or less kind of see what's been used, what's yet to be addressed or uh, brought in here. Also a ladder logic representation so far of what we've done, which is not that uh, complicated, but it's uh, something that can be exported into a, a PDF. Um, Right at this point, we can't do it into a DXF, but uh, into a PDF, we can uh, export that. Also, a configuration summary. If you wanted this to go along with this configuration and has all the information on what we changed, if we had changed the debounce time on some given input, it'll highlight that as the uh, setting that we selected. It's giving us the information that we need to keep in our files to uh, prove that this thing has got all of the uh, address concerns that we needed. We even have response time down here. When you're looking at, uh, well, we haven't included yet, but if you happen to have a light curtain included as an input, part of that requirement for light curtains is to at least take into account what is the safety distance. Well, how far away have you placed this light curtain from the hazard? And part of the formula for figuring out what that's going to be is the inclusion of what is your response times of your safety devices? And here it's giving you uh, 12 milliseconds. We're only using one safety output so far. Even though there's another one available, we've only used the uh, SO1 output. All right, so out of that output, um, the gate switch, we added a little bit more debounce time, so that one is going to react uh, with a little bit more time on there. What else? Uh, let's go back here and notice that we do have another safety output on this given module that's not being used. What could I do with that? Well, if you've ever had a need for an environment where there is something in motion, something spinning, and the inertia of that motion, which could be hazardous, is not going to come to an immediate stop just because you killed the power, there may be a time when you need to have a door interlock that is lockable. 
and to be able to unlock that, you're going to need to send a signal to that gate interlock so that you can now yank on the door and actually open it. So this actually is a, a setting you can perform on the safety outputs where going into the advanced tabs, I can now address this unused safety output to give me an off delay. That off delay I'm looking for is because I want that output to stay on uh, a little bit longer before I give it a change of state to now unlock the door. Now that could be performed with some sort of a a, um, a motion or a, um, a speed monitoring module uh, where you're using some prox which is right on the shaft of a motor for instance but there is an alternative way of doing it by just addressing the output that's going to give us a certain time when it will stay active until a certain time has elapsed. I'm giving it three seconds here. And there, it now is addressing it with 3.1 seconds of off delay. If for some reason there was a need to allow more time for a certain apparatus to come up ready before you apply uh, the output power to it, then uh, that might be an on delay uh, and a selectable uh, setting on that as well. So. I can now pull this straight to this, and now I have an immediate output as well as a delayed output. Um, so, so far we're really talking about one module and using solid state outputs to now go from this module to what, maybe a, another safety PLC or something that doesn't draw much current. You could easily attach it right from these safety outputs. You've met the requirements if you're trying to be a certain category. It, uh, it can be these OSSD outputs are safety rated outputs. They're redundant. There's actually two outputs on each one of these uh, that are working off of two types of microprocessors within that module. So we're meeting all the requirements for redundancy and diversity on that. If I wanted to use this output for something other than safety, even if I want to allow it to remain with a uh, off delay on here, I can choose to split this. If I don't need the redundant output because it's not going to a safety output device, I can split it. Nice thing is uh, these are still rated for a half of an amp, so they still have some decent current ca uh, carrying capabilities. Uh, and if I'm not using them for safety, I can use those now for status outputs instead of uh, having to be stuck with only the use of those convertible input terminals, I can now assign SO2A or SO2B as a status output as well. So it, it gives us a little more capability with something we're not necessarily using. Let's go a little further. If I delete this, why do I want to use my safety to feed and drive solid state outputs if my goal is to use contacts instead. Now I can look at an expandable module like we have now, go back and add that relay. There we go. I've added a relay module and in fact I've added uh, a module that has two pairs of contacts uh, within. In other words, I can have totally independent control from one set of relays and I still have another uh, set of relays that can be driven off a totally different uh, uh, machine that you might want to incorporate into this layout. But now that I have some relays on there, let's go back to our functional view and instead of necessarily tying this to a safety output that's got solid state, I can ignore that and the module or the uh, function block I'm going to instead come right off of is the uh, latch reset. Up here in the top, we've added another module, so we're have, we have the capability to go to module number two. I can either do it right here and go to page two, or I can actually just hit the arrow, and now I'm looking at, and let's get that back to size, I'm looking at the relay module. Well, I could have built my entire logic my inputting, my AND gates, and everything on this view if I wanted to uh, because we're simply dragging it right to the relay module. But because I have it on another page, I can reference whatever I want from that page to show up on this view. So 
I'm going to go down to reference. I'm going to select that LR1. That was the last uh, thing on the line that I wanted to bring to this relay module. And notice it shows up here and I can drag it to there and it's completing everything I was asked to do. In fact, it's got this dotted line around this icon, if you notice. And if you go back to this view, which was the one we had previously, it now has placed a dotted line around that, just to kind of highlight that this is used as a reference somewhere. All right, if I had filled up with all the capability I want to do here, and maybe including some other functions and other logic that I want to use because I want to use this more for controls, something that maybe the PLC did, uh, OR gates, AND gates, exclusive ORs. You see a lot more Boolean logic here, but it's sometimes uh, necessary. You might need an exclusive OR. A good example for an exclusive OR enter, for those of you like me that haven't seen this for quite a while, uh, Exclusive OR is a type of a logic block that you will need to allow the output to turn on if only one input is on. If you had two inputs coming in that both turned on, it's going to turn the output off. So it, it exclusively only allows you to either have one input on, on this side or that side. And again, you can basically select more than two inputs here, but that's an exclusive OR. Um, a good example might be a sliding door, a, a, a robot situation, or at least a situation where there's two sides to this thing, and you have one sliding door that if pushed all the way to the right, it's going to open up a, a access point on the left where you can reach in and grab the completed parts as long as the uh, hazard is now present where the door is closed. So you're going to have a sliding door that activates a switch on the left or a switch on the right. That is going to work out beautifully with an exclusive OR because you're not capable or able to ever, or you shouldn't be able to uh, close both switches at the same time because the, the door length won't let you do that. So it's only going to allow one, in to be, one input to be on at a time. That, that's just an example where safety-wise you might include an exclusive OR. All right. Let's, uh, let's do something else here. I'm going to delete this for now. Um, we haven't really talked about some of these function blocks. And the example I gave you earlier where I laid out all the parts on the table, one of them happened to be a two-hand control, or at least the buttons to use for a two-hand control. When I select a function block that is a two-hand control, this is going to be not really, uh, we definitely need this before we can carry out a 2N control, but what it's waiting for is where's my 2N control inputs? So this is the anti-tie-down. This is the logic that's built into this block, and you don't have to program that it has to see both inputs within a half a second. It's already addressed in this block where it demands that if you're going to bring in a pair of inputs, call the 2N control, right there. Here's your typical wiring out of our safety rated STB buttons, for instance, where there are two micros that give you uh, two outputs and they are complementary coming from each button. However, it might be a, an older style uh, two-end control where it's more or less using a common go and do some complementary input. So there's some wiring choices at least you can choose from to match up to the device that you're using. Even something that's probably not, uh, it just depends what it's coming from, obviously. There's all types of two-end control input devices, but uh, you have this choice of single uh, PNP inputs coming uh, from both of your inputs as well. But there does have to be two buttons or two switches that are going to serve as a, a two-end control. All right, now that we have that, that to be dragged into here. What if we want something to override this two-hand control? And uh, a good example of that would be an e-stop. Um, now, this can be included where all of our inputs and our e-stops and our gate switches could be brought into this gate or this logic block, I'm sorry. But right now, there's nothing available to bring that in. So you highlight it. You now select in. 
that in can be an AND gate. It could actually be coming right from here as well. That's going to be allowable to do that. But there are certain rules that you cannot use a 2 end control and now go from here into another type of a gate. Let's say I did want to AND this. My uneducated selection was, well, I want to include, oh boy, this, this gate switch and this output from the 2 end control. Well, it's going to stop you. It's trying to keep you into a valid 2 hand control situation governed by the standards, and it won't let you take a 2 hand control and AND it with some other device. So if you want some other influence to affect the 2 hand control, it's got to be done on the input side. We want the 2 end control to be the last thing at the end of the line. Anyway, I just want to highlight that you know these function blocks you bring in here do have some priorities, some logic that allows you to do certain things. Um, let's also talk about, no, I'll get rid of the 2 end control here and the 2 end control input. Uh, into this AND gate, let's say I do want to bring in some, uh, some uh, light curtains. So I'm going to now add another input capability here and add a light curtain. But I want this light curtain to also be something that is going to be mutable. It's going to be an entry light curtain or an exit light curtain on a, a palletizing application or something where I want the capability of this to be mutable. Well, that is going to require mute sensors. So I'm going back to my safety inputs and selecting a mute sensor pair. And again, there's all types of choices here for solid state or whatever you want to do. Um, but now we're going to bring it into uh, a muting block. We have the mute inputs. We got the sensor or the input that we want to mute. And let's select a function block. Excuse me, that jumped out. Of, there we go. Function block, muting block right there. This is nice. It, it gives you a layout choice that you're really going to possibly use for your application. If it was a, a simple exit type of uh, light curtain from an area that's very hazardous and all you're doing is wanting the package coming down this conveyor to influence the light curtain to allow it to pass through but as soon as it's done passing through the light curtain and it clears the mute sensors then the protection on that light curtain will be back. Well there's a couple of choices for doing that. Uh, one of the, uh, and here's one that you probably see as common for muting, a cross pattern on your mute sensors this diagram is kind of showing you looking straight down on this thing. But if the package coming through is going to eventually block both mute sensors by blocking the path prior to coming into the light curtain, then it will mute the light curtain. And because it's a cross pattern here, it will stay muted until the package has cleared the light curtain. Makes sense. But sometimes these packages or whatever coming through the curtain are not consistent in size or, or um, uh, size or direction, not direction, but the layout might be that they are skewed to one side of the uh, conveyor instead of coming straight down the middle. Well, that may not work so well with the cross patterns. So you might want to consider this, where you're using not just a pair, but two pairs of mute sensors. And when you select this, it's going to ask that you bring in two mute sensor pairs. So it's got an input for MP1 and MP2. So I'd have to introduce another mute input pair and bring that in to satisfy this layout that I've created. Let's open this up again and choose something else. This is a, a nice thing here. If you consider, or I do have a situation where you have a hazardous area, and now that it's coming out of the hazardous area, you want to not allow anybody from the safe side to somehow defeat the muting while their buddy block, you know, gets in there and gets into the hazardous side by running through the curtain. If we want to keep that from possibly happening, this is not a bad consideration. We're allowing the mute inputs to be on one side. Well, if this did not, the reason this wouldn't work normally is if you, your package, as soon as it clears a mute sensor, it turns off the muting. Well, we're allowing with this selection for there to be a uh, off delay that you can apply. I can add up to five seconds of off delay so that when the end of the package clears the mute sensor, you've got five seconds to get through the light curtain before it drops out the muting, which is 
a nice way of doing it. It's considered an L arrangement. Um, if we had a mute bar or something lined up next to the light curtain, it visibly would look like an L. Uh, so there's L configurations, there's T configurations that are commonly called something like this selection here. But at least it gives you some, some uh, selections where it automatically addresses how many inputs you need. And along with that, you can select how long do you want the muting to continue if this stayed in the same position where the mute sensors are constantly blocked. It might be an advantage to be able to take away that muting. Uh, I'm going to leave it at 30 seconds, but a choice for muting also, you can use it as a infinite timing, and they give you some warnings as to that, that, uh, hey, if you leave it on infinite, something could sit there and be blocked for days, and it'll keep muting the light curtain. Is that going to work out for you or not? So, Also on here, if you want some overriding permission switch, uh, I'll call it, uh, called a mute enable, that's going to be something that you can introduce where even if they tried to block the mute sensors and get somehow in through the curtain and be on the other side, there's no way that they could actively mute it if this mute enable was not on at the first uh, prior to the mute sensor being blocked. It's, it's a great way to add a little bit more control to it if you need to. Anyway, let's set that up. We're going to drag our mute sensors in here. And we're going to drag our input into here. And again, this might make more sense if I pull this out and, and uh, if it looks a little bit better, if I position it in a totally different area, that's, that's good. You can move things around if you want. Um, now that we have this, and this, if this has a timer on it, I might want to track a light. We talked about the uh, PLC earlier driving some sort of status information through some tower lights. You can do that, all that with this controller. If I go back here to the equipment view and add a status output, I now can track what was not there previously, this mute. And it's not tracking the mute inputs. When I say I want to track mute, I'm tracking that function block called mute so that when it times out, I want this input to basically go off. And that's pretty much what would I have here. I'm, I've, I'm tracking the mute block. If it timed out after 30 seconds, this output would go from a high to a low state. Or you might want to turn on a light to indicate that the muting is not there anymore. Whatever the situation is, uh, you can now track that individual mute function, not the mute input, but the mute function. OK. So far, so good. Um, other things that can be used here as far as function blocks, it might come in handy for, um, well, our 2N control. We've already talked about that. Bypassing is really not considered a safety input. You're, you're trying to override the safety, but hopefully you're bringing in things that are going to be a safer thing to use, such as a, a jog input. If you can bring in a switch to place your object in JOG um, because you want to go through this gate to access the, uh, the, uh, the guts of the machine so you can mechanically or maintenance-wise set up something in there. The good thing is you've at least got some control here. You've got some control saying, I think this should only take three minutes to acquire or to uh, go into this gate and make the adjustment and get the heck out. So you can set this so that it does expire after a certain time which should give them plenty of time to go in there and, and do their thing. Uh, it prevents the accidental uh, switch being left on after they've walked out and the, mute, uh, the bypassing is still evident even though they were done with it. it it'll time out and, and allow you to, uh, to at least uh, turn off the bypassing if you know it doesn't need to be on anymore. So part of that bypassing is going to have um, Oh, by the way, if I clicked on this, where should we apply bypassing? What can I learn about bypassing and how to utilize it in my safety? Uh, if you go on any one of these properties sections and click on info, you're going to go right to a section in the PDF that talks about proper ways of bypassing, um, things you should include, like lockout, tagout. That might be a better way to do it. Uh, if, especially if it's a robot, there's times when I've seen OSHA pretty much shut down anybody being able to start up a robot or something in a robot area 
without lockout tagout. So there's uh, times when that's probably necessary instead of allowing for a bypass. But these type of things and wiring choices and that uh, sort of information is available if you click on the info tab. Also, you'll find the whole manual available, obviously, if you just go into the section up here and, and get right into the, uh, the support information, and you can get into some uh, manuals that way. Uh, what about network capability? I mean, I've, I've done a few things here and added a few things, and it's telling me what I have yet to connect. Uh, what about uh, network? I'm going to basically join these two again and ask this to go to that direction. Um, when you are wanting to uh, have all of this status information sent out to an, an HMI or to an Allen Bradley product, uh, we do have a setting up here called Network Settings. You click on that, and now you give it the IP address you want. Um, there's, uh, you know, once you finally, let's see what's in the Advanced tab, by the way. Okay, here if you want to get into, uh, especially for Modbus or Ethernet IP, if you want to do some swapping of the character bytes and that type of thing, you have that in the advanced settings. Otherwise, if I'm good to go here, I've given it an IP address, uh, and I say, okay, let's go now, what you have is going to be another, um, once I've got the network capability, I'm able to, to look at, let's see, Excuse me. I want to make sure this thing does have the uh, network capability. There should be another network tab that came up here. Let's go back and check. Did I set this up for... Yep, I do have Ethernet capability on this guy. Forgive me. Not quite certain where my uh, what I'm waiting for here. Well, I'll, I'll get that figured out. We do have uh, network capability. will will create a um, it'll create a, a virtual status output that allow you to um, allow you to send all this information out to the to the uh, devices that you want to monitor these statuses with. And it might be very possible if I'm using a relay module. I'm not certain at this point. But um, let's, let's look at the wiring diagram again just to make sure that we have plenty of room. When you are going to run out of capability, it's going to show that if I keep adding e-stops, for instance, eventually, as I use up those IOs, it's eventually going to give me a reduction of choices that I can use. If I want to keep using four input terminals and I'm using the I.O. and there's we're down to our I.O. 8 which was the last selection for our uh, output terminals, it's pretty much taking away the ability to get that four terminals. In fact, how many do we have? We probably only have two terminals left here. So that's what you'll see once you start to run out. And if you simply add another input module, if it comes down to that, you're going to now have more, um, more. Whoops, that's a safety output. Let's get rid of that guy. I want to add an input module, so I'm going to select inputs, and let's get 16 more terminals. Now that you do this, you can continue to add more e-stops and it'll simply call out that you're using this other module that has more input capability. Even if you're on the same functional view, you can add all your inputs and it'll tell you right here, if I'm adding enough inputs where I have to use that second input module, and I want to go to four terminals now. There's my four terminals that are back and right here it's addressing that you're not using the first module, MO, anymore. You're going down two places and using the inputs that are available on M2. So it's addressing where those inputs are going to be wired into. Um, but you can basically add as much complexity on this given page as you want. If you want to make it simpler, you can simply add another page. And uh, by adding another page, you can 
build another section of your logic on that and use some referencing from previous pages or whatever you want to do. So a lot of flexibility on what can be uh, what can be handled here. Here I'll just show you something that I did um, just to show how complex it could be. It, it's not it wasn't necessarily that difficult to do, but I had a customer that wanted to have the ability to choose safety outputs that were um, ganged together. He wanted the ability to bring in, let's get this pulled up here again. He wanted the ability to be able to change the, the uh, the off delay without going into the configuration and changing it. He needed to have uh, something that was giving him the freedom of not opening up the cabinet, not allowing somebody to get into the configuration to change it from, for instance, uh, a two second off delay to a four second off delay. Uh, part of that was because they wanted the ability for the person setting up the machine to actually uh, apply their safeguarding onto a given machine that's at site and they needed to know how long is this thing going to really take to come to a stop so they had to have the ability to at least have something set up wise to be able to uh, change this without actually getting in the configuration so I came up with this where on the functional view I'm showing that here's the typical safeguarding that is available on that person's machine and because I want an immediate output as well as a output that's going to give me some off delay I'm going to basically just allow him to hook up four inputs and we're going to serve uh, those four inputs as a binary selection for instance this would be the first one would be binary one and that would be binary two three would be the addition of these two so by simply bringing in inputs, and they can be uh, selectable by an HMI or just a little bank of switches or whatever the person that's setting up this machine wanted to use. But what I've done here, you can't see much on this view, but where I've taken, you notice there's a lot of things I've referenced. I have a little dotted line around this RS1, which is a, a reset flip-flop, a reset dominant flip-flop. Um, I also have some other things I'm bringing back from some other pages but you can see I've got some selections that are anywhere from one second all the way to 150 seconds. Well, how the heck can I do that just with four inputs? Here's a page two of this functional view. I've taken those binary inputs and gone to some AND gates, and I wanted to not lose the capability of canceling these when I needed to or, or having an e-stop basically override all of this. So I have the uh, layouts on all these different AND gates and I've referenced it from the previous page on those four inputs and to finally get to the point where we actually have some selectable timing that's available there's a third page and this is just to kind of show the flexibility and also the complexity but now I've referenced every one of those AND gates and they are now going to a specific bypass function block well I'm not using bypass but I'm using the capability of having that timing available on a bypass block and with that, and you'll see how this works. Um, folks at CNE, you may have not seen this yet, but I want to at least uh, show or, or anybody that hasn't, nobody seen this version of software, I'm privy to being able to at least work with the engineers and we know this is going to be available here hopefully uh, the first few weeks of January, but I, I just want to show you something that's coming. Um, and it's going to be this right here. This is a simulation mode. The simulation mode is going to allow you to basically prove your whole uh, configuration without having to even wire up to the controller. If I select this simulation mode, I'm now able to, and it's going to be most advantageous to look at the function view here. I'm able to start and actually turn on my inputs. Let's say I wanted this light curtain to be on and you can see the color changing is a nice feature. Um, 
my e-stop is on, my gates are closed. I've actually given this a reset enable so that not anybody can hit a reset unless that thing is active. Well, all right. Now it's waiting for a reset to really start this thing. So I give it a reset, and both outputs are turning on. If I want this output to basically give me a certain off delay, I'm going to enter a certain binary selection that represents a certain timing. For instance, it might be a very quick, a very quick uh, off delay I want, so I've selected something equivalent to binary 3. When I open up a gate or hit a uh, permission switch to go through this gate, Whatever turns off the immediate output, you can see that the other output, it took a little while before that finally shut off. Let's do that again. I've closed the door. I hit a reset. There's some delay there. There it finally went. Well, what delay is that? To show you that, I'm going to add a lot more time on here. I'm going to select a binary setting that gave me a very long time of delay so we can go back to the other screens and see what's going on. But you'll notice right now I've selected with this binary selection, it's already activating certain things that are going to be prevalent. If it's a very quick 0 to 5 second, you'll notice that that is going to be addressed back there. Uh, if it's a longer binary setting, 10 to 40 seconds. If, it's, uh, if I want to add to that, it starts to affect the 50 to 150 milliseconds uh, here. But basically I'll just show you if I have this gate switch. Outputs are on. I open up the gate switch. I've now got a delay going on. It's quite long. Well, let's watch and see what happens here. What's affected? When I go to these other function box, it's affecting by the binary selections, affecting this AND gate. Well, that all these AND gates are referenced on the next page, and that specific AND gate is only affecting this one specific bypass block where I'm getting 80 seconds of bypassing and there are, in this case, 80 seconds of off delay. So that's what's going on right now. And after 80 seconds, it's something that's eventually going to turn off that output. So it, it's a nice way, way of incorporating something for these folks that gave them the capability they were looking for. They didn't want to have somebody go into the configuration and know the password of how to change things. They just want to temporarily find out which timing worked for their module. And after that, they could hardwire that binary input and uh, it would stay at that certain timing from then on. So anyway, it's about 10.30 here. I just want to, or 10.30 Central Time here anyway, I want to make sure that uh, you had at least a view of what there is to uh, be done uh, on this module. Even currently, if I'm uh, just going to finish up here by showing you that even with the current version that's available, we can easily allow for uh, you to do some troubleshooting on the module itself. For instance, I'll show you my, uh, my mug here again. Here's the controller, and here's a relay module that's on this. This is a demo, and this demo is used uh, by a lot of our sales force just to basically go out and show you things that uh, you can do with this module. We have some inputs that are available here so that, for instance, when I hit the 2N control input, I get an output that you see coming on. If I want to create a fault, and, if, and it's convenient with the two-end control because they're right here available to me, but if, I, if it took more than a half a second for that second switch to uh, engage, the second button to engage, I'm actually creating some faults that are held within this controller right now. So let's look at what those are. I'm connected to this module. And if you noticed, these lit from a gray state to an on state. I am going to read from the controller. And if I just want to view the fault log, it will allow me to do that without giving it a password. Here's those simultaneity faults that I just created with the 2 end control and at what time I did that. So I can clear the fault at this point or close it. If I want to see and pass in the whole configuration itself, then it's going to require a password. Like right here, I have import configuration and network settings. OK, well, it did give me that ability. I have it in front of me. And what I can do, and this is available on all the, the uh, software levels that are presently downloadable from our site. 
a live display. If I want to see what's going on and I click on live display, now I'm able to see again with that nice green and red indication which outputs are on. If I want to, it looks like right now I've got uh, an e-stop that's ready to roll. Uh, I've got certain outputs that are on <coughs> and there's some that are not on. SO2 is no longer on. Well, that's because the 2N control has not been pressed. If I put both fingers in there, you can see that it turns green. If I do only hold one button down and after half a second I don't get that other input coming in, this is an example of a fault. It turned yellow. Or where else can I see this indication? If you notice all the little spinning icons that are going on are giving you all the views that you can see a live display and a very helpful one is this wiring diagram. If I was getting constant faults, um, it might be a wiring issue, a loose wire, or whatever. I'll do this again with a two-end control. I'm only holding down one, and after half a second, it gave me a fault, and it's giving me the indication that it's right there on the input side where I have a problem. In fact, terminal IO1 is where I'm not getting an input to happen. So it's great for troubleshooting. Even on this live mode down here, I'm actually showing the two-end control fault, but it's giving me at the very bottom of the screen what is that fault code. So it's, it's nice, and you can look that up to find out exactly what it is, and it happens to be a simultaneity fault. So for troubleshooting's sake, it's, it's very, very convenient just to be able to hook into that micro B connection right into USB and, and get a tracking on what's going on in your situation. Okay, um, that's the live display. Any questions now? I, uh, I haven't asked this earlier, but if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I've, uh, Steve? I've got the, uh, yes, sir. This is Jeff. We do have one question. Hey, it was a question from one of our attendees asking about the inputs, if they were uh, NPN or PNP. Ah, oh, very good question. They are PNP. Yeah. Uh, I know some of the competition might be using NPN, but we want to keep this so that it will always be able to detect and not get confused with an off uh, a power input that's not on. In other words, a PNP, you're going to get a positive indication that the, the gate is closed. Uh, if there's a wire that falls off, you're going to get a low signal, and that's showing you, obviously, the, the two differences between an on and an off state. So uh, we've always just supported the PNP side. Okay. And that was our, uh, wait a minute, I think I do have another question come through here. says the industrial ethernet is up there now. Yes it is. Thank you. Info. I'm not I'm not sure what the uh, what it was waiting for. <laughs> Here it's showing that so far, thank you. Um so far I I don't have anything assigned. Uh, but if I do want to do an auto configure instead of addressing which one is going to show me a gate switch, which one's going to show me the status of an e-stop if I do an auto configure for everything that's on this layout that I have, it automatically addresses, and this happens to be in the mod bus, if you notice up here, uh, it's giving me the locations on the 30,000, 40,000 register of where you'll find the, the tracking of all of these conditions here, as well as you know, system lockout, uh, waiting for reset, all the things that could possibly be tracked are automatically populated here. If instead I'm going to an Allen Bradley, some control logics, I can select the uh, the Allen Bradley, and now it's giving me, and I would want to set this up for input instance 100 and 16-bit word or 16-bit uh, with length of eight words. Um, that's where you're going to see the toggling of information when you're going to a control logics type of a setup. So it's it's even got the old uh, very old PCCC if you're looking at a, a slick 50 or slick 500. So all of those formats are already set up there as soon as you hit auto configure. And there's nothing wrong with adding more. You can have more virtual status outputs to track some other things uh, if you wish to. But at least in the auto configure mode, it, uh, it populated that right away for you. So thanks for uh, catching that. All right. Well, Steve, that looks like all of our questions. And so. Okay. If um, to our attendees, if you'd like to know more about this product or you have an application, please let your CNE salesperson know. 
we have two safety engineers on staff here at CNE, Heinz Connected and, and Steve Wright, and we can come out and take a look at your application and try to try to help you solve uh, those issues that you that you may be having. So, uh, Steve, did you have any closing remarks? I I didn't. I thank you for all your interest, and I thank CNE for allowing me to be a, a part of this. It's a great opportunity to be able to highlight some of the things that we're uh, doing on these controllers. So. Thanks again, folks. All right. Thank you, Steve. You bet. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.